All right, and with Jake Brennan from Disgrace Land, which is one of my favorite podcasts, and is, you know, just uh, so good every week. And that's tough, as you know, in the podcast space. Thank you, man. When yeah. you're, you're putting out a lot of content, you're hoping you hit most of the times, but I guess Disgrace Land hits for me because I love music. And also love because I know a lot of artists now, and they're not always what they're cracked up to be publicly. Some are better, to be honest. Sure. There are those, even in country music, like a Keith Urban, better than he could even be on a microphone. Mm. Or a Lionel Richie, who I work with on American Idol. Yeah. The greatest guy. However, and I won't mention them now, I don't want to get sued, and they're still alive. <laughs> there are some real turds out there, too. Sure. And yeah. so, whenever, you know, I was, I, I li I've listened to probably almost every episode, but I went and I started looking at kind of the genesis of why you created the show. And I want to read you this. and Tell me if it's still true. Because you wrote, rock stars are more like feral narcissistic animals than functioning members of society. And that's what makes them so entertaining. Yeah, I still believe that. Yeah. 100%. It, I, after I, doing all this, you still feel... Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. You know, I, I think it's kind of like what makes rock stars, like I said, so interesting. And a lot of times... Uh, as you know, musicians, artists in general, but musicians, they come from these backgrounds that are incredibly challenging. And that leads directly to the types of people they are. And that leads to the type of music and art that they create. So they go hand in hand. And I think that for people like us who are sort of uh, involved in the entertainment industry to some respect, uh, this stuff isn't surprising to us. But for people outside of music, it's really shocking. I often say it takes a really messed up person to make really messed up art which we like but it takes the same kind of person that's making that messed up art is the same person that's messed up also in like human activities exactly and that's what makes it so relatable you know what i mean and there's degrees of being messed up and there's you know a, a lot of people when i launched the show thought it was going to be some sort of like gotcha type of thing where i'm i'm like coming after these artists or, and, and, and i'm not i'm just telling these stories that are out there and I don't want it to get lost that I have a lot of empathy for not only the victims, but for the artists themselves in some cases who are also victims. They're all incredibly different and complex. Uh, and there's tremendous music at the center of all this, and we can't lose sight of that. I'm going to ask you some difficult open-ended questions because you've done so much, and I'm just going to throw some things at you. And if you don't have an answer immediately, we can come back around to it. But okay. I, you've done all of these, these artists. Some I'd never heard of, but have now learned a lot about. Some obviously thought I knew a lot about until then. But which one of everyone you've covered did you go, they're so much worse of a person than I would have ever imagined <laughs> after diving into it? Uh, Rick James. Rick James. And uh, a real criminal-minded dude, even before he became a musician. And, uh, you know, he was like running drugs for the Colombian cartel. <laughs> he was just, he was just a, a, a bad dude in a lot of ways. But, you know, at his core, he just wanted to make great music and entertain people as well. So they, those things go hand in hand. It's a real dichotomy and it's very interesting. To hear the episode on Jerry Lee Lewis, which he's from near where I'm from. So I had heard the stories, but I mean, he married his 13 year old cousin. Yeah, you would expect it to not get worse than that. <laughs> but of course, <laughs> his otherwise later wife, uh, she met a demise very early and uh, that nickname, the killer, may, be, uh, may have rung true in different ways. But what holds on longest even after, because again, not a good dude, and was still, you know, was probably really bruised by Elvis blowing up at the same when he was in his mind and a lot of the other people's mind that guy. Yeah. But then it is Elvis, and you know him, and he drove his car over into Elvis's fit. You know, it was a whole thing. Yeah. But still, the cousin thing lasts longer in people's minds than the the other antics that happened later on, which were worse. It's such a shocking thing, and when it happened to him when the when he married his cousin and, and the story broke he was neck and neck with elvis he was huge he was a huge star much bigger than we knew him as him as because we're younger and elvis goes off into the army so the, the lane is kind of cleared for jerry lee lewis to really break through and kind of leave elvis behind but then that story blows up and it doesn't happen so i think it was getting away with murder jerry lee lewis getting away with murder is the title of that episode yeah or something like something yeah. to that effect do you think he, for sure, you th do you think he got away with murder? I think um, there's enough evidence to, <laughs> I'm going to be careful with my words here. That's why I took that for sure. <laughs> That's why I said, do you, do you, do you think there is a uh, reason for there to be a lot of, of suspicion? I'm not a journalist. I'm not an investigator mm -hmm. at all. But I think in the public record, there is enough information out there that people can very easily come to the conclusion that... Uh, like I said, the nickname, The Killer, may be a little more realistic than, than just a, a fun nickname. He came back in country music and had a 
rather robust country career mm-hmm. after he was, we'll, we'll call it canceled. Uh, you know, yeah. th- their version of canceled after he was canceled for the cousin. He came out in country music and had a pretty good career. Yeah, in a lot of ways. I mean, he not only, it wasn't like a niche career either. I mean, he he was a household name again. He was huge. I mean, there was an NBC special devoted strictly for him, that, you know, about his comeback. Um, so yeah, massive household name. Also then, Bobby, I mean, you know, like, there was no internet. It was easier to kind of like leave things in the past. It was easier to forget about things and to move on. How many second acts do we see now? We still see them, even with cancel culture. So it was um, it was a lot easier, I think, for Jerry Lee Lewis to bounce back and reinvent himself. Another episode that I really enjoyed was the uh, Johnny Paycheck episode. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rough dude. Rough, very hardcore. I was thinking about this uh, a couple weeks ago. You know, so the name Johnny Paycheck comes up and a country music listener, a country music fan will be like, oh yeah, great, great singer, great songwriter, you know, hardcore guy, outlaw. You know what I mean? Anyone else, the name would come up and you'd be like, if it wasn't a musician, you'd be like, that guy shot a dude in the head. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the claim to fame. But it, it, it's not for some reason. You know, it's like when you're a musician, I guess shooting a guy in the head is not the craziest thing you could do and be known for. His story is... In Ohio, a bar in Ohio, is that where that happened? Yeah, he was going home to see his mom for Christmas, and he stopped off at a bar. Um, and he was going to Hawaii, Ohio. I think it was in Ohio where he stopped off. And he goes into the bar, and he's, and he's drinking alone, and these two locals recognize him as being a local guy, and they, they, start, they start to mess with him. They get, they get like, they're basically, like, making fun of him, you know, for being the celebrity that he is, you know, big time. In Boston, we call it, you think you're better than us? Like, that type of thing, you know? And, uh... He just got ticked off. He pulled his gun, and, he, and one of the guy ran. One of the guy ran away, and he shot him before he got out the door. And the bullet grazed his head, and uh, the guy lived, but you know, pretty bad. And uh, Johnny ended up going to jail for it. You know, Seven one of years. the sad parts that uh, really sad parts of that episode was at the end. He kind of when he died, broken, pretty much alone. Yeah, yeah, which is is sad, man. You know, a lot of times we envy these artists. We think they have these musicians, especially. We think they have these very full, fulfilling lives. Um, but you know, fame and celebrity can be, it can be super lonely. And I think for some of these guys who live way off the rails and way outside the guardrails of society, you know, there was no one there for Johnny at the end when he died, despite the uh, pretty amazing massive funeral and party that they threw for him. Your background, if I'm if I'm still, you were in a band, are still in a band? Not a, no, no longer in a band. I'll never be in a band again. <laughs> so so, but you you have a music background, right? Yeah, yeah. I was I've been in bands my whole life. I came up in the punk and hardcore scene in New England. Um, played in bands, um, made a very modest living around the margins, and then started the podcast. And this kind of became my life about three years ago. Are you doing well now? Because I see you everywhere. It seems like yeah, the podcast has been great. We've we've you know we've we've grown this massive audience and it's led to a lot of opportunity i was able to uh, get a book deal and write a book and that's done very well and now i'm producing podcasts with other producers as well as other ones that i host and executive produce so it's kind of it's it's become this little career for me that i never expected to happen i mean you know 10 years ago i didn't know what a podcast was and now here we are are you telling people listening that they can support themselves and pay bills if they get a, a successful podcast i am definitely telling isn't them that, that wild yeah yeah, it is. It's nuts. I'm very grateful, man. Very That's, grateful. You've moved over to just yeah. Amazon now. Disgraceland is available exclusively on um, on Amazon Music, and it's free. You can get it over there. Um, but we have other shows. We just Rolling Stone magazine announced our new franchise today. It's called Badlands, which is basically Disgraceland for everything but music. So season one is called Hollywoodland. So it is what it sounds like. It's all actors and actresses. Season two is Sportsland. That'll be available widely everywhere you can get podcasts for free. I host a number of other shows as well. The 27 Club, which is available on iHeartRadio app. Everywhere podcasts are available. Same with Dead and Gone, a show I teamed up with Payne Lindsay from Up and Vanished to do. So we have a lot going on. Disgraceland is exclusive. Amazon Music is growing rapidly in the podcast space. There's You can basically hear all of your favorite podcasts over there. That 27 Club series. Now, do you think there was actually something to it or just a, a wild coincidence? That, wild coincidence. Right. You know, but it, it you know made a cool lane for me to create a podcast series. <laughs> Season three actually launches tomorrow on uh, Janis Joplin and the 27 Club. The Janis Joplin, and I haven't heard that one, but I, I, I do know a lot about Janis Joplin in that she, she didn't have a hit till she's dead. 
Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. That's nuts. I mean, she was a thing. People knew of her right, but clearly. Not, but not as, she wasn't right. a, a song on the, you turn the radio on, right? you know, somewhere in Florida and also in, in Connecticut. Yeah. Like, that was after she died. Yeah. Yeah, the first album didn't do so great. A lot of people didn't like that band. They didn't like Big Brother and the Holding Company. It wasn't until, it wasn't until the band who was on that, that uh, later record that came out after she died that people really started to give her the credit that she deserved. I'm a big 90s fan, obviously, because I was born in the 80s. So the 90s is what I consumed mm. in my growing years. Yeah, yeah, me too. And so, you know, some of the stuff in the 90s, uh, Tupac. Mm. You know, I know there's a whole, I listened to you talk about Tupac and Biggie. Any chance <laughs> that Tupac lived past that shooting? No I'm chance. not even saying he's alive right now, but any chance he lived past the shooting? Well, he lived for a couple of days before he died, but he, he, no, no, no way, no way. I mean, I get why there, why the ground has been softened for this conspiracy theory that he's still alive. I mean, he talked about his death. He certainly had reason enough to sort of fake his death. His life arguably could have been uh, less complicated if he kind of like disappeared and went had a life somewhere else besides, you know, under the, the uh, protection of Suge Knight in, in the death row world that he was in. But no, there's, there's no way he's living on an island in Belize or, or anything like that. I don't I mean, believe it. Him talking about his death is a bit like Andy Kaufman, where everyone wants to believe Andy Kaufman is still alive because he always said he'd fool everybody by coming back, you know, 10, 20, 30 years after he died. Yeah, now that, now that I would believe. <laughs> well, I, well, but I don't. You don't believe Andy Kaufman's alive, do you? I think Andy Kaufman is Donald Trump. And I think this whole, this whole, the whole last eight, four years. I mean, wouldn't that be the greatest... <laughs> If he, pu he pulls off the wig and's like, gotcha. Would you, I'd believe anything in 2020. Yeah. You know, anything. If Biggie's music came out now, and I've said this for 10 years, do you think it would still be new sounding? That's a really interesting question. Because no, nobody sounds like Biggie. Nobody sounds like Biggie. He did, he did that kind of like cool reverse peanut butter and chocolate thing where he, he took that, that West Coast sound and, and put his East Coast thing on it. And I don't know. I mean, hip hop now just sounds so different that I, I have no idea what it, how it would be received right now. That's what, that's an interesting question. What about Juice World? Uh, what about Juice? Tell World? me about. I don't know. Tell me about the guy. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know anything. I'm the wrong guy to ask. It, I mean, he, are you going to cover a Juice World? Because again, he just died. The the more modern artists are tricky for a bunch of reasons. Um, uh, especially when people, the story isn't entirely told yet. And like I said, I'm not a journalist. I'm, I'm going after stories that are out there in the public eye that are, that are, um, safe, so to speak, that can be told. Um, and a lot of times you get away for these stories to completely be finished. I just did an episode on Lil Wayne. It's not out yet, but it was written and I had to rewrite it twice because the guy's still active and he's still out mm -hmm. there and there's still things happening to him. Um, so, you know, possibly on Juice World, but it won't be for a minute. Didn't you do an episode? On, what's the guy's name? Tenacion? XX Tenacion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. XX Tentacion. Yeah, XXS Tentacion. That's a tough one. Did, you did an episode on him, right? I did, yeah, about a year and a half after he died. Um, yeah, that, that story was, uh, I mean, that was a brutal guy. I mean, he was a violent guy. He did a lot of nasty things. Um, and But that murder was vicious. And, you know, there's a guy who was really young. And I think we see this a lot. You know, a lot of people, just, they just cannot handle celebrity. They're not equipped to handle it and whatever demons they have and whatever bad behavior they have inside them and wh whatever uh you know lack of humanity they have it the the spotlight brings it out and uh that's definitely what happened to that dude if kurt cobain would not have died do you think nirvana would have had the cultural impact lasting cultural impact that it has yes you do oh, i do yeah for sure i mean they had it at the time they were huge i mean and they broke that door open they broke the dam for every for all the whole grunge thing that came after Nirvana came first and it wasn't one of those things where Nirvana was just like, you know, they had the right single and they had the right music industry apparatus behind them. I mean, Kurt Cobain obviously was a true artist and I don't know that Kurt Cobain would have, would have hung around in Nirvana for that much longer. I mean, I know they would have done another record. They were talking to Scott Litt, the producer about doing some, their next record. Um, but I don't know if he would have stayed in that band or that band would have hung on or if Dave Grohl, frankly, would have wanted to sort of sit behind a drum kit for the next 10 years of his life. Have you ever met Dave Grohl? I have not. No. Okay. And I've been in the room, but never actually had a conversation with him. Mm. He does such a good job at talking about Nirvana, but I got to think somewhere he's like, am I ever going to stop talking about Nirvana? Yeah. Because he has created one of the biggest American rock groups of all time, yet he still will always be second fiddle to the band he played drums in. Yeah, I know. It's bizarre, man. And I'm, I'm sure he's, I'm sure there are quanti there's quantifiable evidence out there that the Foo Fighters are actually more successful than Nirvana in, in different ways. Sort of like, 
Jacob Dylan has like a a, a the the a better selling album than Bob Dylan does, <laughs> which is shocking. But um, I think Dave Grohl figured out a long time ago how to play the game so that it's not really playing him. And it's all this like magical defense mechanism that he has. But I'm sure he, at the end of the day, he sits back and he's like, God damn it. <laughs> right? And he does. He handles it so gracefully. He answers the questions and then gets on to himself. Yeah. And you know, everybody wants to ask him about it. Yeah. The longer you're away from it, when you, you know, Cobain died in what, 93, 94? 94, yeah. yeah. The longer we're away from it, like a cooler part of history it is that the drummer is sitting next to you. Even though, again, in the past 30, 40 years, on the Mount Rushmore of American rock groups, Foo Fighters. Yeah, on. yeah, it's crazy. And they're still still incredibly relevant today, which is not an easy thing to do. I was in a record store down in Florida last week, and that their big display was the Foo Fighters' new record. Nice. That just nice. came out. I yeah, mean, it, they're playing, uh, they're headlining Bonnaroo, right? Yeah, they sure are. Crazy. If TMZ were a thing back in the 50s or 60s. Oof. Right. <laughs> it, like, who wouldn't have lasted? I don't know. That's a really interesting question. The thing, the thing we don't, you know, when we look back, we always kind of measure it against today's standards. And one of the things we forget is that the music industry and society were wildly different back then. It was so much looser. You know, the music industry was like, I mean, think about it from the record executive's perspective. They're doing everything they can to try and wrangle these, you know, narcissistic feral animals to keep creating music so that they can keep bringing in the cash. But so the, I don't want to say they were encouraging this. In some cases they were. Uh, but there, it was free reign, and, and the industry is being built up at the same time. Like there, there wasn't this existing apparatus like there is now. So, uh, I mean, there was so much going on. I think it was way more depraved than we can even begin to think. You know, the stories we hear, I think, are the tip of the iceberg. And more than the fifties and sixties, seventies and eighties, and when the Van Halens and yeah, the, still the, crazy, just nuts. Even the stories they share now in their books, in their interviews, probably are just the tip of the iceberg on what really happened because they know if they shared it all, right. they'd probably cancel now with even sharing their history. Right. Exactly. I mean, I've heard things from people that's you know not, not corroborated, it's secondhand, and it's, it's so far off the mark. And, and now, I mean, outside the, outside the bounds, so far outside the bounds of, of society. Now, and now that I'm, I'm doing this series, Hollywoodland, we're looking at... Uh, stories on actors and actresses in some cases that go back to the 1930s and the further back you go the bigger the stories become the more crazy they become because time has has gone on and, and, and these stories are, are able to be more easily shared and i think we'll get that the further we get away from the those pioneering days of rock and roll as well of all the country artists that you've researched who did you feel was least like what they portrayed on stage or publicly least like well you know it's this is a boring answer but it's it's a good one to me and it's an honest one i, I think johnny cash because he was he went through so much during his career you know in in the 50s and 60s before he settled down with june carter he's just a he's a he's a walking disaster he's a time bomb you know he's caught smuggling drugs across the border he's caught for burning down a a a, a uh, protected far forest on government property all these things happen to the guy um but at the same time he goes on and he becomes this real champion for the underdog and this this empathetic spirit and you know i think he was kind of the opposite of the question you posed he was on stage who he was off stage and all those country guys i mean johnny paycheck was the same way uh graham parsons the same same exact uh way but in a different way because he was you know a little more soft but yeah, the country guys kind of live it a little more authentically, I think. The chicks, the formerly known as the Dixie Chicks, still, oddly, in my opinion, aren't forgiven by a lot of the public that is in the country music world, which is weird because... Those You're talking the, about the George Bush thing? Yes, and, and yes. So they're, they haven't been forgiven for that... Two, I don't know, what is that? 2000... 2002? One, two, yeah. yeah, around that time. And I was talking about this on the air because the people that's screaming... Let's cancel cancel culture are the ones still holding it against the Dixie Chicks mm. for what they did that wasn't a crime, wasn't morally wrong. They just had an opinion right. at a time where that opinion was a bit sensitive. Like, What is your take on why people can't get over that? I don't understand that at all. I mean, maybe people just want to just want something to complain about. I mean, 
people's opinions in real life, real people's opinions, especially on politics, change all the time. You know, people don't wear the same team colors their entire lives. And who knows if they even feel that way now. I'm sure they've, they, they don't. I'm sure they've, they've come up. I mean, I don't know if they defended themselves. I don't know much about the Dixie Chicks. But, I, you know, I think as uh, Americans and fellow humans, we could all deal with a little more uh, empathy and humility and this, this country be a much better place. I listened to your podcast and you can tell you spent a lot of time writing it, recording it. But what, if, what goes into this? Like you sit down blank screen and go all right we're gonna no 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 <laughs> it's um I, it's i do a week of research at a minimum and then i write for i write an episode in a week and you know now we've got i've got 10 guys 10 people working for me at once where we're we're constantly uh the music is being worked on it's it's a real process but my process is i write for a week and you know i re i record it and then it goes uh you know i, I quote unquote score it I, you know i'm not a composer but i indicate where and what kinds of music i want it and where i want it to be it goes off the musicians put it together and uh it gets mixed and then it comes out and it's something that is you know it's a it's a big production cycle that is constantly in motion but what's the production cycle you know back when you started episode one versus now where there's I mean, you've got a real beast on your hands here that you've got to maintain. When you yeah. started it by yourself and you're, you know, I can't play the song right now. I'm just going to yeah. hit it. I imagine you're doing most of that by yourself at the very beginning. Yeah, I did everything by myself in the beginning. And the first episode took six months to put together. Wow. Yeah. Why yeah. six months? Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a process. There's a lot of trial and error. I had to figure it out. You know, I had to go through like three different versions of what I thought the music was going to be. Um, ultimately, ultimately, everything I tried doing collaboratively with people, I ultimately ended up being like, this isn't working, I'm doing it myself. And that's the opposite of how I've done everything in my life. I've been, I've been a very collaborative, creative person my whole life from being in bands, even though I was the leader of those bands or, or the singer or songwriter. Um, but you know, when it came to this, I don't know, I think instinctively and in, deep down I was getting older and I, and I knew this was probably like the last thing I was gonna try and do before I had to get like a quote unquote real job. And um, relying on people didn't seem like a good option. So I just started to just break things off and do it all myself. All the research, all the writing, all the music, all the production. Uh, pretty early on in that first year, or later on in that first year, I brought in a uh, engineer who's still with me, this guy, Sean Cahalan, who's worked on every single episode to kind of do some of the nitty gritty work, cleaning vocal, editing files, all that stuff that takes hours that, you know, if you're doing that, you're not researching and writing. And he was the first one I brought on, and it was just he and I for about a year. Then iHeart came into the picture. We, uh, we, we started working with iHeart. I brought a couple more folks on to help with music, to help with mixing. And you know now I've got a team of, I think we're at, we're almost at, uh, we'll be at 12 people by the end of this year of writers, uh, producers, engineers. Hey, congratulations. Yeah, thank I you. I mean, that's really cool to see you turn the beginning. When I, I mean, I listened to episode one. Yeah. Thank you. It's like, I can't play the song, so I'm going to play a little Casio keyboard here. <laughs> to, to say, you know, it's not just Disgraceland now. It's, you know, all it, you've turned it into so many things. And then when I see stories, for example, uh, P. Davidson, who's going to play Joey Ramone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, well, what do you think about this? Yeah, I love it, actually. I think that's great. I think he's going to kill it. I'm rooting for him. You know, he's going to get killed. I mean, the Ramones fans are going to be all over him. But I, I think he's a New York guy. I think he'll know how important it is to, to get that role right. And I think he'll do a good job. I listened to the episode on Joey Ramone. And I think it was Joey and Johnny. Yes. Yeah. And what did you learn about the Ramones that you didn't already know? You know, I actually met the Ramones when I was 10 years old. My dad's band opened up for them. Um, and I remember, you know, I didn't know who they were. And I remember my dad telling me, uh, he brought me because he knew how important it was. You know, and he was like, uh, you're going to meet these guys or you're going to see these guys play because you're going to love them. They're like the Beach Boys, but they're really loud. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all these years later, I'm like, yeah, it's kind of right. And, uh, you know, I, I don't even really remember meeting them, but I remember them being around and they were these big, tall, clad in black, mysterious figures. Um, and they kind of blew my, blew my mind. I went back to my neighborhood, started telling everyone I knew about it. And all of a sudden these punk rock kids are like kicking my ass because I thought I was lying about it. It was this like, total, total life changing, changing thing. Um, but even, even with that experience and growing up being a fan of that band, I didn't realize truly how much uh, Johnny Ramone and Joey Ramone hated each other and just how dysfunctional the band was and how sad of a story it is. It's really sad. Talk about family hating each other. Uh, Oasis, 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, are they ever? I think so. I think they'll I think they'll get it together. I don't even know how much of that is. I mean, I know it's true, but I feel like for each of them, there's a part of them that knows that it's it's for the cameras, it's for Twitter, it's for whatever. And I think eventually they're going to end up back together. Did you do an episode on Oasis or is one coming soon? Did I yeah. see one of those? I just released a two-parter, two-parter on Oasis uh, these past few weeks. Yeah. Okay, so what, what about Oasis do you think most people don't know? Because I, uh, I was a big fan when they put out What's the Story mm -hmm. for about three records. And then mm -hmm. I just got tired of the shenanigans. Yeah. And I stopped. Yeah. And I watched a documentary. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. You know, I'll go back and listen and, and enjoy, you know, some of the stuff from when I was 12. Those first two records are still incredible, though. Yeah. Man. They're incredible. Um, I, I didn't know just how hard they lived it, you know? I didn't know, especially Liam. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, I, I didn't really look into it as much before I had to write the episode on him. And the, the one story I love that's in <laughs> that's in there is this is later in Oasis's career. Like, I think in the early 2000s, uh, there was some dust up at a hotel in Germany and uh, Liam gets gets knocked out by the cop and and pulled into the station, and he wakes up and his two front teeth are missing. And uh, the cops explain to him that yeah, he fell when he was passed out on the stairs, and they got bashed in. And of course, he's a smart guy, and he's like, well, if they got bashed in, they'd be bashed in, and they're they're like clean out, you know, like they they were like yanked out with like the cops wanted to get back at him, they yanked him out with pliers. <laughs> That's brutal. That is brutal. And also for him to think about that right then, because you're right. I think I would just accept it. Yeah, I'm not going to teeth out falling on my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're just clean out of his head. They were so big, especially at home. I mean, they were the second coming. They were, they were almost Beatles. They were the Beatles and the Sex Pistols. That's how I describe them. They were, as far as, as, far as the UK was concerned. I mean, they were, they were like, they were everything. They had the attitude and they had the songs. It's a shame they didn't keep it going. It's a shame they didn't get, we didn't get 10 records out of them. Well, in the States, too, their hits were mostly acoustic-y or feel-good, bright songs. Mm. So we, I didn't know how dark it, they were until I got older and could actually learn or cared to learn more about them. Yeah, they were hooligans. Straight up, violent soccer hooligans. It's the best. <laughs> uh, I, I think I saw a picture of you and Conan O'Brien together. Yeah, yeah, that was wild. I met him at this thing. Uh, it was funny. <laughs> I was... You know those things you got to do for podcasts. You got to go out on stage. You got to talk about it. And there's a bunch of advertisers in the room, and and we were at one of those things. And uh, I was waiting in the lobby to be let in, and I noticed Conan O'Brien walk in, and uh, he kind of looks at me, and uh, you know I look back at him, and then uh, someone says to me, "We're talking." Goes, they're, they're like, "Hey, Conan O'Brien is like staring at you, like like with evil eyes." I'm like, "What?" And I turn around, he's like daggers at me and we're both kind of wearing the exact same thing i noticed we both have on like jean jackets you know pompadours jean pants i'm like he's probably pissed that i'm, <laughs> I'm dressed like him you know and then i walk up and he's on he, now he's on stage i'm waiting in the hallway and he's coming off stage and uh i i see this woman leading him right to me and uh he, he gets close enough and he goes is this him and he points at i hear him say that. i'm like what the hell is going <laughs> on and i love conan you know i'm from boston so i'm like you know I'm a little freaked out. And he comes up, he's like, I love your podcast. And he tells me that, uh, he's like, you know, I had to go home the other night and I drove around for an extra hour so I could finish listening to the Brian Jones episode. I was like, oh man, you don't know what that means. <laughs> like, that yeah, that's means gotta so be crazy, much. huh? He was so cool. He was so cool. And Aaron Mankey from Lore, that he does his podcast, Lore, this guy I know he was standing next to me. He was, he was, he was smart enough to be like, hey, let me get a picture. And he got a picture of the two of us, which was cool. Always good to have those friends. They can also step in and make, it, uh, in my case, maybe not look like a dweeb, like when I'm with somebody cool. Yeah. Because I want to be like, hey, man, can you mind if I get a picture with you? Yeah, yeah. Because it's always, <laughs> then you're not as cool as they are. Right, exactly. But, exactly. but if someone goes, hey, this would be really cool for both of you guys, let me get that picture. Yes. I'm like, ah, okay, yeah. man, I guess. Then, like, you're, then you're on their level. Then, yes, then it all stays the same. <laughs> I wish it was like the 70s or 80s where everything was candids. You see those great pictures of like Jack Nicholson at Joan Didion's house just hanging out, having a conversation with Mick Jagger. And you're like, you know, that's the stuff that I want on my walls. Yeah. But that's never going to happen. We're in a different world now. You know? Mine are all me taking a selfie of me with somebody famous behind me. I'm like, look, <laughs> I know. They're behind me. Uh, you did an episode on Joe Exotic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was kind of a joke. That was right when we hit the pandemic and I was looking for ways to just stay as connected as possible with people, with the listeners, and I wanted to do them a solid. And that was in the middle of that whole thing. And I was like, hey, man, can I do an episode in three days on this thing that we're all watching right now? Because I heard he was an actual singer. 
you know, right. and then I knew the story about how he kind of like, you know, he's singing in that in that series, but he's lip syncing someone else's songs. It's kind of a Milli Vanilli thing. So I was like, oh, I can use that as the kind of crime. It was all very tongue in cheek. And I put it out. I had friends emailing me. They're like, hey, you know, he wasn't a real singer. I'm like, yeah, I know. It's a joke. <laughs> Did you learn anything, though, about him that we didn't see on the show? Because I like you watched every episode. Everything. I, I He got in this bad car crash. You know, he was sort of, you know, he was... You know, he growing up in the South and homosexual and how to keep all that down. And that contributed to who he became and how he, he lived his life. But there wasn't much more out there besides what was in the show. What's the story about Disgraceland, the name, why you named the podcast that? Oh, that's, uh, that's Jerry Lee Lewis all the way. I, once I read that, like, you know, in researching that first episode, I knew I was going to do the podcast. I knew I needed a name. I had no idea what it was going to be. And I read that the locals in Nesbitt called Jerry Lee's place Disgraceland. Uh, you know, in juxtaposition to Elvis's Graceland because they were, you know, two different people, obviously one dark, one light. So I was like, oh, that's it. That's my show title. Has anyone from any of the artist camps or families reached out to you and been pissed about what they heard? No one's been pissed. I've heard good stuff. I mean, I've heard, I've heard from people's families, um, family members. I've heard from cops who were involved in some of this really? stuff. Yeah, I heard from a cop who was involved with the, uh, the LA riots when I did the NWA episode. Uh, that meant a lot to me. That was he gave me some good feedback. I heard from um, I heard from this dude. You remember that show, Welcome Back, Cotter? Yeah, of course. It's the guy who, who uh, <laughs> created that show. Was at the table with John Lennon and Pam Greer at that dust up at the Troubadour in L.A. That was in my John Lennon episode. He got in touch right away. He was like, "You nailed it. That's exactly what happened." I was like, "Really? Okay, cool." <laughs> uh, coolest fan of the show? Uh, coolest. Other than Conan, let's remove fan Conan of the show. But a similar thing where you're like, dang, it's pretty cool they listen to this. Um, I don't know if he's a, if he would call himself a fan, but I got to spend some time with Elton John because uh, it was brought up to him that I interview him when he, when he was doing this tour for his uh, for Rocket Man, and the fact that he had already heard of the show and knew of the show, a mutual friend had been at his house and played it for him, played him actually the John Lennon episode. The fact that he had that awareness of Disgraceland allowed the interview to happen, which was wild. That is pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, again, there are only so many living legends we've had this debate on on this podcast and my radio show where it's like who is the living legend and elton john's definitely one of them we I got know. we got a little iffy on coldplay yeah no you say no <laughs> okay um but El my my greatest elton john story is i, I was sitting at a charity dinner and i like to tell the story because how often do you tell a story with you and elton john right yeah. like you said it was just cool to be able to be in the same room but right. we're sitting literally right beside each other he they just had their kid oh, so, yeah. he, so he had an ipad and he had pictures of the baby, and he was showing me pictures of the baby. And he was like, look at it. And he was going to go up and play. Um, one of my friends is professional tennis player, Andy Roddick. He used to be a professional mm. tennis player. But Elton John was playing his benefit, and I was hosting it. And so we're sitting at this table, and he's showing me pictures. And it's been, a, I would say, a little flirtatious at the mm. same time. But mm -hmm. hey, it's Elton John. Whatever. Let's go. <laughs> and so we're, we're having a good time. I can't believe I'm hanging out with Elton John. We're talking. And he goes up, and he, he plays probably 10 songs or so and he's got a little prompter he has so many songs he reads the lyrics can't right. chase all the high notes like he used to but it's probably 70 percent there but the whole crowd's loving it and about the last four songs he stands up and acts like he's done everybody gives him a little standing go and he sits back down and does another song well the final song i think he played circle alive for i don't know what song it was it doesn't matter but let's just act like it's circle alive so he had circle of life <laughs> he walks off stage Grabs me by my head and kisses me right on the mouth. Oh, my and God. And then keeps walking. And, I, and everybody looked at me to see what I was going to do. I was like, yeah, baby. That's awesome. That's my Elton John story. It was amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Yes. yes. That's fantastic. That's great. So you're expanding like crazy. List me off again the shows that I got to go check out now. I, I listened to Disgraceland. What else you got? Uh, 27 Club Season 3 launches tomorrow with Janis Joplin. We have two previous previous seasons on um, Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix. And then we've got Badlands, which is this new franchise delving into Hollywood and sports. But it's basically Disgraceland, just in these other cultural subject matters. And I've got a show on The Grateful Dead called Dead and Gone that I do. It's an investigative show that I do with Payne Lindsay, who's an investigative podcast, true crime, about all these missing and dead deadheads. Um what else? What's happening with that? It's crazy. It's wild. Is it just a culture? And in that culture, there are just yes. a bunch of weirdos and then there happen to be a few murderers? Yes. Dire wolves. It's basically, I mean, look, <laughs> you live that far off the grid as a deadhead. There's some wild stuff that's going to happen. And that's what happened. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's followed the Grateful Dead their whole career. And it, it, what makes it so interesting is that the Grateful Dead is obviously, you know, they're not a violent band. I mean, the whole ethos of the dead is, is the complete opposite to mayhem and murder. 
but it's there it's embedded into the into the culture in these uh in these little sporadic moments and the stories are pretty fascinating okay and uh, i just say holly what's hollywoodland hollywoodland yeah launches may 5th okay and, and listen he shows up he brings me four 30 dollar scratch offs yeah. there you go like when he pulls off in a fancy car four 30 dollar scratch offs <laughs> you know life is pretty good for jake <laughs> that's how you know <laughs> but listen, uh, we met years ago in LA at the first ever iHeart Podcast Awards. Yes. And I felt guilty because I won the award and didn't deserve it. And I, I remember telling you that I don't deserve this award. Your podcast is the best one here. Oh, man. I don't know about that. No, it's you, true. You're I, doing great things. You have, ins- you have inspired me in a gazillion different ways. You're doing so much. You are hustling. You have an amazing spirit and a lot of hope at the core of everything you do. And I think right now that's what we need. And I just want you to know from day one, from from when I first got hip to what you were doing, I was like, this guy's the real deal. And we need more people like you. It's inspiring. I appreciate that. And you look just like me. It's like a mirror. He's wearing the same glasses. It's the same. (laughs) Yeah, but I looked like you first. So that's true. I'm older. Just barely though. (laughs) So what are you doing in town? Why are you in Nashville? Uh, I had to do some TV stuff, and then I'm um, headed to Memphis uh, right now, actually, right after this. I hop in the car, head to Memphis, meet up with, with a friend, and we're doing some research, and then I go back to be with my family in Florida for a couple of days. Is it Elvis research? I can't say, but yes. Do you think any chance Elvis lived past the, the toilet? Uh, yes. You do? Not in any real way, but I, I, I'm going to play with that a little bit. I'm going to mess with that. Any chance the misspelling on his grave was on purpose? I don't know. That's shocking, though, isn't it? Yeah. That's crazy. How does that not get through? I mean, that how does somebody is, not uh, catch that? Yeah, that's nuts. I don't know. Unless they're just dicking with them on purpose. The 70s, man. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> you, well, do you think Elvis, at his core, was a good person? I think at his core, he was a good person, for sure. But I also think there's a lot that went on with Elvis that challenges the narrative and the myth that uh, people think is, is false, that was pretty wild and pretty out there. And... Um, yeah, I think he had his demons and, you know, I mean, dude, he was the most famous person on the planet for a very long time and living in this insane bubble and the pressure of all that uh, is something that we could never realize. And I think it came out in violent ways that, that we haven't really heard the full story on. Um, you know, he was, he was obsessed with guns. He was, you know, he, he had tricky relationships with women, obviously the food thing. I mean, just nuts. I am a big fan. I appreciate you coming by. You guys can follow Disgraceland Pod. That's what I follow. Are there other podcast, uh, other accounts you want to? Yeah, me you about? can follow uh, at Disgraceland Pod on Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're on Facebook, and then of course all the other shows I do, I do for my production company called Double Elvis. That's just at Double Elvis. You can find that everywhere as well, and you can hear Disgraceland on the Amazon Music uh, app. That's amazoncom slash Disgraceland. Well, big fan of what you do. And if I win on one of these scratch offs, I'm not going to say it was one of these scratch offs. So you don't claim it. <laughs> That'll be its own episode 30 years later. I had to end up killing you because you came for money that I was like, no, I wasn't it. Uh, Jay, good to see you, bud. Thanks for having me. Thanks for I appreciate by. it. Thank you. Bye. Hey guys, it's Bobby Bones. Welcome to the channel. If you're new to the channel, subscribe and then go check it out. A lot of artists, a lot of songwriters, a lot of music. Welcome to the Bobby Cash channel.